In our last program, we had looked at the markets and internal trade in India during the Mughal period. In this program, we shall examine foreign trade. We are on the river Hooghly near Chandanagar, a suburb of Calcutta about 60 kilometers away. As we float down this river, we can witness the presence of five different European countries within a space of less than 60 kilometers. They were Portugal, Denmark, England, France and Holland. Except for Denmark, all the other countries traded with India during the Mughal period and flourished much after them. The discussion on the overseas trade of India must necessarily dwell on the activities of the European companies trading in India. That is because we have large number of archival sources of these companies stored in different places in Europe, namely those of England, Holland, France and Denmark. Out of this, the Danish trade was practically insignificant compared to those. They had been at Trankabar in the beginning of the 17th century, but they could not put their foot really in Bengal before the early 18th century, and by 1717, they had been driven away. So there remained only England, Holland, and France. But before that, we have to deal with the first European company, the Portuguese. And then we would have to see the difference that was created by the Portuguese in the framework of the Indian Ocean trade. The Indian overseas trade was divided into two directions. One was going to the Western Asia, to the Middle East, and the other to Southeast Asia. Before the coming of the Portuguese, the Indian Ocean was a free trade ocean in the sense that there was no monopoly of any king or a ruler, or any company, or of any merchant. The commodities were free in the sense that anyone can take any commodity they want. They would, of course, have to pay taxes, and the taxes differ from one place to another, from one port to another. But the basic uh, feature of the pre-Portuguese Indian overseas trade was that here the merchants of different nations like the Chinese even or those of Arabia, Turkey, Persia and as well as India, both Gujaratis and Muslims, Jains and non-Jains, they used to do their trade in the Indian Ocean. The government did not interfere. No government actually interfered. There were certain conflicts, it is true, but these were trivial and not related to the principal framework. So the principal framework of pre-Portuguese trade was more or less the freedom of the sea. In 1498, we know Vasco da Gama came to Calicut. He declared that he had come to search Christians and spices. There is no objection to that. But then he declared that the Calicut king, who is called Zamorin, should drive away the Muslim merchants from Calicut, which the king refused. Then Gama bombarded Calicut. It had practically no effect. He left and went to Lisbon. After he had reached Lisbon two years later, 
the king of Portugal declared himself a lord of Ethiopia, that is Africa, and lord of Asia, including Indonesia, India, etc. This he did on the basis of a certificate granted by the Pope giving him this right. The Indian rulers, of course, did not pay much heed to this certificate of the Pope, but they had to follow the Portuguese for another reason. The Portuguese sent Cabral to India and he declared war on Calicut and allied with Cochin. He divided Cochin into Portuguese and India. And then there was constant struggle between Calicut and Cochin, supported by the Portuguese. By 1506, the Portuguese had declared that the spice trade of Asia, including India, would be the monopoly of the king of Portugal. This is a completely new thing so far as Indian Ocean is concerned. This is a new framework that they are putting up. By 1510, Albuquerque had conquered Goa from the Sultan of Bijapur. 1511, they had got Manila and Hormuz. So by getting these places, the Portuguese created what is known as the Triangle, Hormuz, Goa, Manila. And the entire area in between them is called by them Estada da India. The empire of India, one might say, or a state of India, one might say, other way. Now, in this, the Portuguese had created another particular feature, which was quite new. The Portuguese had started a pass system. That is, every ship that sailed the Indian Ocean had to take a permit from the Portuguese authorities. Of course, they had to pay something to get this pass. In Portuguese, it is called Cartaz. Cartaz is a must because otherwise the Portuguese would attack the ship. And since the Portuguese navy was very strong then, most of the Indian rulers, including the Mughals, who had their own ships for trade, in both in Southeast Asia as well as in the Middle East, had to take this kind of kartas. So therefore, even if the Indian rulers did not follow the diktat of the Pope or that of the King of Portugal, in practice or in reality, they had to follow the Portuguese rule or the new concept of the framework that they had imposed. The Portuguese dealt mainly in spices. They were not asking for the cloth, not much. And their trade continued quite merrily till the Dutch had come in. After the coming of the Dutch, as we would see now, the whole thing changed the framework got far more complicated and the Indian merchants were gradually at a loss to understand that a small country like Portugal, neither very rich also, could have this control over the Indian Ocean from thousands of miles away. Now, this attempt of the Portuguese to control the Indian Ocean is, was not very effective in the sense that the Indian Ocean is a vast area, it's a very, very large area. And the Portuguese did not have this kind of machinery or the infrastructure to control this trade completely. As a matter of fact, one of the leading historians of France, Fernand Brodel, called the Portuguese excise inspectors of the Indian Ocean. But that began to change also because of the corruption 
in the machinery of the Portuguese, the income of the state began to decline. And although the cartas has been criticized by some historians as parasitical, which is difficult to accept fully, the trade of Goa, which was one time very flourishing, began to decline by the end of the 17th century. But for that, perhaps the attacks of the Dutch and the English were far more responsible than merely the corruption within the machinery of the Portuguese. But the Portuguese had shown the Europeans two particular features. One, that they can do away with the Mediterranean merchants. Before the coming of the Portuguese, the Indian merchants would carry their merchandise to the Persian Gulf. From there, another group would take it to Cairo and Alexandria. The merchants from Europe would come to Cairo and Alexandria and trade there. Indian merchants also used to go as far as Russia and Central Asia, but these were mostly served by the Middle Eastern merchants. Now the Portuguese had shown that there is no necessity of the Middle East. One can have a direct trade between India and Europe. This direct trade between India and Europe was one of the features, second feature of the Portuguese which they gave to the English and the Dutch companies. The methods of the English and the Dutch companies were not uh, very different from those of the Portuguese. They wanted also to control the Indian Ocean. But at the same time, being far more powerful and resourceful than the Portuguese, they wanted certain privileges in the Indian ports, like less tax and other things. Now, the Dutch and the English, they started in the beginning of the 17th century. Out of this, the financial condition of the Dutch was far better than that of the English. The Dutch began to come to Indonesian and Spice Island for spices. But there was a problem. The problem of the Dutch was that in the Indonesian and in the Spice Island, there was no monetary system. It was not a cash nexus economy and one would have to make exchanges of commodities. To do this successfully, the Dutch began to take cloth from Coromandel and from Gujarat, take these cloth to Indonesian and Spice Island, get the spices, and then ship to Europe. Now, this was a kind of a problem that also bothered the English in the beginning. But the English had also another problem. The problem was that the Dutch did not want the English to come in there and therefore the English after a few years began to concentrate on the Indian ports itself. Meanwhile, by the 1660s, the Dutch had conquered most of the positions of the Portuguese. Manila, Cochin, Colombo, all these are gone. Even by the end of the 17th century, the Dutch had conquered the four principal ports of Southeast Asia, which debarred practically the Indian merchants from trading. And it is stated that actually this was the cause of the decline of Surat from the early 18th century. Although the historians had not given much attention to this aspect, so far as the decline of Surat is concerned.
but the Dutch trade continued. They had their headquarters at Batavia. But their factories were in Nagapatanam, Masali Patanam, Santhom, Hooghly, Surat and so on. It was a very extensive empire, far more extensive than that of the Portuguese, and the Dutch trade continued to flourish. <music> English, following the Dutch, now concentrated on the Indian ports. They had a factory at Masalipatnam, early 17th century. By 1623, they had conquered Hormuz from the Portuguese. Then they had Madras in the 1630s. In the 1660s, they had Bombay which was given as a dowry by the Portuguese king for the marriage of Portuguese princess and English prince. Now, th with this was added, after 1632, when the Mughals had driven the Portuguese away from Hooghly, the starting of the factories in Bengal first at Hooghly, and then at the end of the 17th century, the English came to Calcutta, purchased three villages from the Subadar Ajimushan, and settled there. In 1717, they got the Farman from the Emperor Farukshir of doing free trade in Bengal what he meant, but the English meant all over India, for a payment of 3,000 rupees annually. They had also got the right to buy 38 more villages, which the Subadar Murshid Kuli Khan did not allow them to purchase. But with this Farman, practically of free trade, there was great corruption. The English merchants, they did their even the officials did their private trade. And they took with them the, some of the Indian merchants as well. At the same time, the English wanted to fortify Calcutta, which they could do after the revolt of Sova Singh and Rahim Khan in Bengal at the end of the 17th century. And it was this fortification that led to the war with Siraj Dola in 1757. And it was this free trade that led to the war with Mirkasim a bit later. But the English continued to flourish, and their trade was mostly in cloth, not in spices. Because by that time, the Dutch had shifted from spices to cloth. The reason was that spices had accumulated so much in the European markets that there was no chance of selling the prices there. Now the English began to dwell on the cloth. The Dutch followed. And we'd see later the French followed that also. The only problem was that the European cloth merchants in Europe, they began to protest. And as a result of their protest and movements, most of the European rulers began to impose heavy taxes on the import of cheap Indian cloth. So both the Dutch and the English now began to shift towards high quality cloth, like muslin in Bengal, and then on to other items like raw silk, opium, sulphur, etc., even to certain extent indigo. This kind of new commodities gave them better profit in comparison to the profit given in the spices. But the principal profit of both the Dutch and the English came 
not from their direct trade between Europe and India, but on the basis of the coastal trade or intra-Asian trade between different places in India in which they could buy easily and sell it. The one problem of purchasing in India for both the Dutch and the English was that India had a very strong cash nexus economy. That is, goods in India had to be purchased with hard cash. For this, the European companies began to import foreign currency as well as bullions of gold, silver and copper. This is one of the reasons why the Mughal mint was very prosperous, the Mughal coinage one of the best in the world. But this was also questioned by the European thinkers in Europe. According to them, their money was going out, which would mean they are getting poorer. They did not account for the fact that Europe was gaining in profit by selling the goods purchased in India or in other parts of Asia. Whatever it is, this kind of uh, debate continued. The East India Company, companies continued merrily. Tapan Raichaudhuri, the noted historian, had stated that the Dutch trade had begun to decline after 1693. This has been disputed by Om Prakash, another economic historian, and he had shown that in the 18th century, the Dutch trade had continued as ever. It was only from the middle of the 18th century, after the Battle of Plassey, that the Dutch trade declined. The French had started a company in 1664 in France, mainly by the initiative of the minister Colbert. In 1666, the French had established themselves at Surat with the Farman of Aurangzeb, the Mughal Emperor. In 1669, they had established a factory at Masalipattam, but they had to leave it due to their quarrel with the Masalipattam authorities next year. They came back in the 1680s. But they had other places there. For example, they conquered Santome in Coromandel, but in Coromandel, they had to fight the Dutch and the Golconda king at the same time, and they lost Saint Thome. It was only then that, under the invitation of Sher Khan, the Nayak of Bijapur, the French had gone to Pondicherry which was called then Puducherry, a small village. This, at the end of the 17th century, became the headquarter of the French East India Company in India. But the French trade, which continued in the beginning quite well, ran into problems because of the continuous European wars, particularly against the Dutch and the English. The Dutch blocked the mouth of the Ganges, did not allow the French ships to go out or come in, and the French company was in a doldrum in the 18th century. In 1719, the old company was dissolved and a new company was made in France. This company, without any disadvantage of having the uh, European war, began to flourish, and by 1730s, or at the end of the 1730s, their trade had almost reached that of the English. So the French continued also at the same time. Eventually, all the European companies except the Danish flourished in the Indian soil. But one must note that the European factories of that time did not manufacture anything. Then what did they do? The European factories, although called factories, 
merely collected the goods brought from hinterland and export these to Europe or to other places in Asia. Actually, the headquarter of the East India companies used to send the order with sample. These are then given to a number of merchants on a contract basis with some advance. And the merchants promising to bring the goods at a particular time, at a particular cost, at particular quantity, used to bring this a little before the arrival of the ships. This is because the goods which are supplied by the merchants are examined very thoroughly by the European officials, by the company officials. And if these are not the same type as the samples, these are refused. But these goods, although refused, are not returned immediately. Because the European companies thought that the merchants would again send these goods back to them. But the merchants are in difficulties because these goods could not be sold in the markets. So there is a constant tug of war between the Indian merchants and the European companies on this issue. There are certain other issues on which the European companies had problems with the state, for example. The European companies wanted extraterritorial rights for their factories and for their employees. That is, if any employee, if he is charged or accused of any criminal or any civil breach, according to the European companies, they would be tried by the European companies themselves. The Mughals did not accept this. They wanted these people, who are all subjects of the Mughals, to be tried in the Mughal court. This created problems in the 17th century as well as in the early 18th centuries. The method of the Dutch and the English, as well as also of the French, was very simple. They had different factories in principal ports. Then they have small factories in the interior called aurongs. These aurongs would bring the goods from the interior, sent to the main factories, and the factories would export them. These are, in general, the basic features of the European trade in India. And next day, we would see the Indian merchants and the state. So, in conclusion, we can say that the European seafaring countries that came to India changed the nature of Indian foreign trade by imposing taxes on vessels and declaring monopoly over certain goods. When they began trade, it was only economics and religion that were the main concern. But gradually, they gained political power. There were struggles between the foreigners themselves and also between the foreigners and the Indian rulers. The so-called factories of the Europeans did not manufacture anything. They simply collected the goods and exported them. Nevertheless, trade between India and Europe flourished right into the 20th century.